Children of Men is a masterpiece of modern cinema. It's a dystopian science fiction film about a near-future Britain in crisis. The world has been suffering from an infertility epidemic for the last 20 years. Many governments around the world are beginning to fail and this has led to a massive influx of immigrants trying to enter Britain illegally as it's one of the few countries that hasn't completely fallen to anarchy. The film follows the story of Theo, a disgruntled bureaucrat who was called upon by a radical political group called the Fishers to help smuggle the first pregnant woman in 20 years away from the government and into the hands of the Human Project, a mythical freedom group helping to fix the infertility plague. The whole film is based around one major theme, and that theme is hope. Director Alfonso Cuaron is able to effectively explore this theme and engage his audience through his expert use of cinematography and his manipulation of established genre conventions. These elements combine to what makes this film into one of the most memorable films of the last 20 years. Let's start first with the cinematography. Coron and his DOP, Emmanuel Lebeski, had a very distinct visual style that they wanted for this film. Throughout his career, Coron has utilized sequences with long, single-take set pieces, and Children of Men is no different. The opening scene is one of these, and he uses it to set up the world that the film takes place in, while also introducing our main character and beginning to establish the key theme of the film. The story begins with the news that the youngest person on Earth, Diego Ricardo, has just died at 18 years old. The very first frame we see in this film is full of despair. The people in the cafe are devastated by the news of Diego's death, not because of any connection to him personally, but a connection to what he represents, the last hope of a future. Our main character then enters and pushes his way through the crowd doesn't even acknowledge the news report and orders his coffee. Black. As he leaves, the camera tracks with him and we get our first glimpse at the outside world, and it's bleak. Desaturated colors and dull palette of greens and gray give us a sense of the austere world that Theo is a part of. This scene was shot on a shoulder-mounted camera and because of this, it bobs and sways as it moves, giving you a stronger connection to the world. By having the camera move like a person, and look around like a person would look, the audience can be easier pulled in, and experience the world if they were truly there. This connection makes the dystopia even more jarring, and what happens next even more of a shock. This first scene sets us up perfectly for the rest of the film. We already know everything we need to know going forward. The world is dying. There is no future. And people are losing hope. And Quaron managed to achieve it all through one single long take. Cuaron really wanted to create a heightened sense of realism throughout the entirety of the film, and many of the decisions he made were based around this, like using natural light as much as possible, and always trying to keep his shots moving, and using minimal cuts in between. He found that long takes were perfect for the realism he wanted to create. Andre Bazin, one of the pioneers of the film industry, thought that long takes were the best way to create realism, as it shows the world as we experience it raw and without cuts. Quaron also wanted to use a lot of handheld camera work to make the film seem more like a documentary, saying that he wanted to look like you were just following the characters with your TV cameras. To further enhance this sense of immersion, Quaron does something that is considered somewhat unorthodox in movie making. Throughout the film, the camera frequently draws our attention away from the central story and focuses us on the world around it. Like in this scene where the camera abandons Theo and ventures amongst the refugee detaining cages. These small expeditions highlight to us the atrocities that are all around Theo as he goes about his life, but also the fact that everyone else seems to ignore them as commonplace occurrences. 
This choice by the director has a huge effect as it shows us not only the world, but the effect that a lack of hope can have on the people in it. Long takes aren't the only thing that the film uses to convey its theme. Cuaron never misses an opportunity to litter his shot with symbolic maison-scene elements. From the frequent examples of religious illusion, like this scene of Key and Theo, appearing very similar to Mary and Joseph carrying the baby Jesus, to the inclusion of symbolic art pieces such as this imitation of Botticelli's Birth of Venus, all of which connect to the central theme of hope. At around the midpoint of the film, there's a sequence that takes place in an abandoned school and has one of my favorite shots from a movie ever. This single frame catches so much of what this film is about. On a surface level, we see Theo and Miriam, the maternity nurse who's been looking after the pregnant girl, looking out the window at the aptly named Key, sitting on a child's swing set. What makes this image truly special though is the subtext. If we break the frame in two, we can see two distinct sides, one light and one in shadow. The parent side stand inside a bare room, covered in shadows with only scraps and rubble scattering the floor. They represent the present. And on the other side of the shattered window sits Key, bathed in light and surrounded by nature, representing the future. The director uses the shattered glass of the window not only to frame her, which draws our eye, but also to surround her with that beautiful, heavenly light, making her appear angelic in contrast to the rest of the frame. The difference in these two sides of the frame show us that for Theo and Miriam, their time is coming to an end. The world that they lived in is no longer a viable option, but with the arrival of Ki and what she could mean, they're finally presented with a possibility of a brighter future, a possibility of hope. I said earlier that the film was a dystopian science fiction, and that's because it shares many of the characteristic traits of those genres. It depicts a bleak and dismal future that shows examples of advanced technology, which are standard science fiction tropes, but if you look closely and past these semantic elements, you can see that the film seems more based in our current world than the future that it claims to be. The issues that the film highlights, the fear of immigration and on a larger scale, a fear for the future, are extremely prevalent today. So much so that you can't go very far without being reminded of incidents around the world related to these issues. This was a deliberate decision by Quaron, who was attempting to use the film as a cautionary tale for the way that humanity was going. The film was released in 2006, only five years after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. It was a time when America and a large portion of the world was beginning to fear the outsider. The combination of mass immigration due to the start of the Iraq war and similar conflicts in the Middle East with the new, often misdirected ideal of defensive patriotism in American culture due to the fear of terrorism led to some of the hardest times for foreigners living not only in America, but around the world. Quaron wanted to use this film as an example of what could happen if this way of life continued, and the negative effects it may have on societies around the world. By making it a science fiction, he was able to address these issues without referencing them directly fearing that a direct approach might be too confronting for some viewers. You can see this if you look at the production design. Even though there are advances in technology, it's all very similar to what we see in our lives today. The cars are just variations of designs we've seen before. The neon lights and digital billboards don't seem as flashy and high-tech as you would expect, and the buildings all still look like ones we have around today. Quaron wanted this future to look relatable, like it was a potential future for our current society if we don't change our ways. 
It's through these manipulations of standard genre conventions that he's able to subtly hint at the real-world connections of the film's major message, and by doing so, help to influence the audience towards creating a better and brighter future. These are only two of the myriad of ways the film uses subtextual elements to create such a memorable viewing experience. Although the film didn't garner huge initial praise on its release, I believe that Children of Men is a true cinema classic and showcases so much of what creating a well thought out film is about, through both the text and the subtext. <laughs>